to us about some Ramen Goku. It's up to you. Would you like one? Can everybody hear me okay? If I just speak, I can use the microphone. <clears throat> what do you think? All right, I'm just going to go for it. Um, I'll try and use my projecting voice. Thanks for coming and staying for this uh, last talk of the session. I'm going to follow up on Scott's uh, presentation and um, lots of good information, as always, uh, to learn about the Round Gobi in New York State. Um, but my co-author here, Nolan Michaels, worked at the um, Shackleton um, Biological Lab for Cornell one su the summer after he graduated from Hobart College and is now at the University of Minnesota Duluth, who uh, and is finishing up his master's there on um, Gobi uh, being preyed upon, apparently, so um, in the Great Lakes. So as Scott said, uh, we all know a lot about Gobi dispersal because of and their introduction to New York State and the area because of uh, a lot of work that's been done. So I'll go through this quickly as well. Uh, initially, it was found in uh, Lake St. Clair, which is, where is the button here? There we go. That tiny little, uh, tiny little circle in between Lake Erie and Huron and uh, has continued to spread through the Great Lakes and uh, even into New York. What's interesting is that the literature says that it's a very uh, uh, non, uh, or a very territorial species. It, it, it only occupies about five meters square and defensively, uh, defends that territory aggressively. Uh, however, there have been other documentations of it moving quite far, uh, up to two kilometers in 200 days, as well as up into streams and tributaries uh, three to four kilometers per year. So in light of that, uh, we were a little bit more concerned about where it would be in the Finger Lakes region. So knowing this graph or this picture from Cornus et al. in 2002 in the review, you can see that the Gobi is everywhere in the Great Lakes, in the tributaries, in the rivers, and as you can see up here in the, um, in the New York State, Central New York area, it's in a variety of tributaries, the Genesee River, it's in the Seneca River, as we know, in uh, Oneida, Onondaga, and Cayuga. In 2011, and then it was initially detected in the northern region of Cayuga Lake, and then in 2013 and 14 in the southern parts of the lake. So why are we concerned about this? For those of you who don't know, they spawn up to they can spawn up to six times a year, which means that their population size can increase quite rapidly within a water body, but also makes it possible and the, the need to move out and colonize new habitat is very um, crucial to this, this process. Uh, it also takes a lot of um, resources, food, shelter, and nesting sites from other native fish and is also known to eat a lot of precious resources, including uh, the initial concern was lake trout eggs in the Great Lakes, uh, and that was a concern particularly for the, for the Finger Lakes as well, where we have our Seneca Lake uh, strain of uh, lake trout, as well as uh, a number of other large game fish, trout and other uh, bass and, um, and perch. So another concern, because my background and my current research also were, uh, is connect connected to mercury studies, we also are concerned about this because knowing what the gobies do eat, there is the, po the possibility of a more rapid transfer of uh, uh, toxins particularly mercury and accumulation across the food web if the, those um, larger prey fish, um, which has been confirmed, like lake trout are, are actually eating the, the gobies. So the, the idea is that the accumulation of toxins fall uh, in the sediment and the, are on top of the mussels, and if we think that the, the round goby is eating mussels, then this could potentially increase the transfer of toxins into their bodies and into their predators. And obviously we can see that it lives in a wide range of water bodies, water qualities, uh, and habitats. So if, if you look at the literature and what they eat in various places, you can see this bottom uh, chart comes from a, a, a diet study of their native range, so in the Black and Caspian Seas. And you can see it's a variety of things, mollusks, um, bivalves, some snails, crustaceans, some worms, even some um, small fish at the larger sizes. But when you compare that to a study that was done in the Great, whoops, wrong button, in the Great Lakes, um, 
by Fitzsimmons, you can see that there's a, a, some overlap with what they eat, but also some, a number of insects, and including the Chironomids and Trichopterans, Ephemeropterans, and this has also been, class, uh, been documented in a number of studies, including Chris Panuto's study on tributaries of Lake Erie. So they, they do eat some of these other things. But one of the questions and the, the curiosities was, do they eat something that is also found native in the range that the, black, the, the um, goby lives in? So hemimysis anomalum is a the bloody red shrimp. It is found native to the Caspian and Black Sea as well. We also have it in the Great Lakes. We have it in the Finger Lakes. So the question was, considering this study that showed that hemimysis was not in their diet, would they actually eat it? Kind of strange, right? So here we are in New York State. I work um, at the north end of Seneca Lake, the largest of the, Great La of the Finger Lakes, uh, next to Cayuga. And we, um, we have a dot number of documented cases in the Finger Lakes. We have, obviously, Oneida and Onondaga, which are not Finger Lakes, but Cayuga is right now the only documented lake that has round goby. I will tell you that, so these studies started in 2016. Um, this year, this past year, 2018, I did find out, and this has not been confirmed by DEC, but an angler did tell me that they caught a round goby in Seneca Lake about halfway down. And that has not been confirmed, but this is what we're working towards, right? Um, so anyways, the question is, are they in these other lakes, and what would they do if they were in these lakes? So here's Seneca in Cayuga. Cayuga here, Cornell's down here. So we uh, went to Cayuga Lake for uh, our feeding studies to get round gobies, but we also did a number of monitoring, uh, used a number of monitoring methods and sites. So along the canal system between Seneca and Cayuga, as well as a number of sites around Seneca Lake to keep track of their dispersal and movement into Seneca. So what we were really curious about is what would they eat if they're in the Finger Lakes? Uh, would it change? Would, what do they eat in Cayuga? Uh, but also, what, do, what type of pressure do they put on both native and non-native uh, resources? So the first question, what do they eat in Cayuga? The second one comes from a suggestion uh, from Chris Panuto that, and I think as well Jim Haynes that suggested that th there was a concern over native snail populations in the Great Lakes declining. And so whether or not the goby would be contributing to that pressure was a question. And then as well, do they eat the invasive bloody red shrimp where this is something that should be on their normal diet uh, or their, their assumed diet? And then if given multiple prey options, what would they actually choose? What would they prefer? So we went to Cayuga Lake to get our gobies. Uh, you could, we used this, uh, I found that this type of seine with a pocket, um, some people call it a bag seine, some people don't. Uh, this was really beneficial in getting gobies. I pulled in 50 gobies in one seine, uh, which was great. Uh, great for collecting them, not so great for Cayuga Lake and whatnot. Uh, but this is definitely the best way to do it. Uh, we have uh, used this net actually as well to, to um, work with Seneca Lake as well. We're not finding them, so that's a good thing so far. Uh, but to follow up on Scott's presentation, our traps also do not work. Minnow traps, standard, doesn't work, Scott, don't, don't worry. <laughs> Baited with dog food and all the other options that you could possibly want. However, I will also confirm that we put an empty trap in Oneida and got lots of them. So, something's going on with the population and the behavior in Oneida Lake. Um, these, these ones are not too keen on the, uh, the, the minnow traps. So we'd go to Cayuga and we wanted to see what they were eating. So based on stomach contents of wild fish, uh, we have a variety of if, organisms in their stomachs. Uh, we also can see that most of this stomach content is mussels, which is interesting. Um, but we do have uh, some snails. We have just a little bit. We have uh, amphipods and we have hemimysis. Now, one of the things that we've learned too with hemimysis is that hemimysis degrade really quickly in the gut. So it's really hard to maybe, going back to that previous study, it's hard to potentially uh, track that in diet and stomach contents. So you have to be real quick about this. And we, we pulled them and preserved them and went, did the stomach contents immediately. So 
what would happen if they were given a set of organisms that I chose, if you will. Uh, we did a number of feeding trials. Most diet studies I've read about is based on wild uh, stomach contents. So I decided to do an experimental method where we set up a, you know, a series of tanks. We filled them with 30 liters of filtered lake water so to, to avoid any other types of prey options that would be in there. We put one goby per tank. We let them allow uh, to acclimate for 30 minutes. And then, uh, and by the way, early trials were done during the day and the night, but we ended up moving towards uh, sunset uh, trials. So we put a variety of prey combinations in, you'll see in just a minute, 30 minutes prior to sunset, so a half an hour after they were in, the fish were in, and then 45 minutes after civil twilight, that's after there's really no light in the, in the world, uh, about an hour and 45 minutes of foraging, gobies were removed and all the prey were filtered from the water. So what did we find? Well, when we just gave them the native prey, the native snails uh, from Seneca Lake that we could collect, now based all these prey options are based on what we could collect out of the littoral zone. Physidae was very um, popular <coughs> among the gobies. Uh, Planorbidae and Pleuroceridae, not so much. What's interesting, too, is that these, shell, these snails differ based on shell thickness. All right? I haven't measured it, but it's really easy to tell that Physidae are very weak snail shells compared to the other two uh, groupings here. Oops. Um, so I think that's probably part of this um, after, after doing a number of trials. Now when we gave them just bloody red shrimp, you can see that they eat a lot, a quite a few of them. It does vary a little bit by size, but more so what's interesting to me is that they do eat them and we can actually uh, detect that in their stomachs right after the trials. The fish are, are uh, euthanized right after the trials are over and then the contents are, of their stomachs are preserved. By the way, the hemimysis were collected the previous mm -hmm. evening um, after sunset, well after sunset, uh, with plankton nets. So then, we, let's make this a little bit more realistic. Let's start putting things together. Let's put just benthic prey together. So we put snails and mussels together. Uh, the, uh, the options, this one, these rounds were the bithnidae, pleuroceridae, and pleuromidae. And Bithendae were consumed more than anything else, uh, which is interesting. Again, potentially something to do with uh, the differences in shells uh, or even just the numbers. Uh, we also have, as you can see over here, these were based, these numbers over here were, this is what's, what was in each tank, and um, this was based on what we could collect uh, using a variety of methods uh, around our lake shores. What happens if you put just plagiot prey in? So hemimysis and amphipods, they're motile prey. They're swimming around constantly in the tank. What happens as the sun goes down and the goby uh, ends up looking around for the prey? They actually eat quite a few more than they would the benthic prey. So about five or six of these that they are actually eating uh, during that hour and 45 minutes. So you can see uh, what the, the preserved prey samples look like afterwards. So then let's put it all together. Wait, this is what I call the buffet. We had that earlier uh, yesterday at lunch, right? So if you put all these options in one tank, what do they eat? Well, they seem to really like hemimysis and amphipods. So that a couple of mussels were uh, chosen as well, as well as the bithnidae snail. Um, so this is really interesting because when you watch them, the light is going down, but when you watch them, some of them are actively going after the moving prey. And that, I think, is really, I think, the most important part of this uh, series of data. When we change it to the data to look at based on how many were consumed based on how many I gave them, the consumption preference is a little bit different. Amphipods were consumed more. So more of the amphipods that were given were actually eaten based on the number um, that, were, uh, that were provided versus how many were actually consumed. So uh, overall, the conclusions are that while mussels seem to be part of the diet based on uh, stomach contents analysis, when you give them a choice and you look at, give them especially um, a number of different prey options that might be um, different in their, their uh, visible detection. Uh, they actually do choose snails. 
They choose hemimysis, amphipods more than mussels. And then also, in particular, they went after the hemimysis and amphipods more than they did the, the sessile prey, uh, although my snails did move quite a, around quite a bit, uh, if you watch them. Uh, but it's interesting because some of the other literature, Diggins et al. in 2002, did show that the, the gobies did prefer amphipods preferentially over mussels, so this is consistent. There was no relationship uh, that I could find with um, size or sex on any of these prey choices. But what's really interesting is that we had empty snail shells in tanks afterwards. And so some whole snails were foraged on, some were partially crushed, and some were empty snail shells with nothing in it. And I swear to God, they went in there full <laughs> with tissue. So <laughs> this is a new foraging behavior, which is really interesting. And I've videoed some of these things, and I've actually seen them go after the snails, so I do confirm that. Uh, but um, but the pretty interesting new stuff. Uh, you, they also can pull off the operculum if it is a snail uh, that has an operculum, um, and then rarely ate some of these other species, probably due to the thickness of the snail. So what are the implications? Well, first of all, all of these trials were set up based on the, the things that we could get in our um, lake, and so that's the, the the, um, one of the important things to know is that they were not equal numbers of prey in these feeding trials, but they were trying to be realistic. Um, and they'll ultimately eat what's ever there, but what is important is that some of these prey are going to be chosen preferentially over others if they can get it. Um, and having motile prey are likely going to be more encountered because they're moving around in front of them. So the encounter rate in foraging is really important to understand while the mussels may be underneath them, they are also something moving, and the gobies are going to go after that. Uh, so that's pretty interesting also from a, just an ecological perspective. Um, and then both, both native and non-native species are being impacted here. So that's going to be also um, a, a, a curiosity in the future what happens, because we're not getting rid of them. They're here to stay, and like I said, they're likely in Seneca Lake. I will also back up Scott and say that it is really patchy. We continue to to monitor Seneca Lake shorelines and in the canal and have had a really hard time detecting them and it's likely because there's just not a great enough population, at least in Seneca right now, to have any, uh, any, um, any data to show, but uh, that's okay with me for now. Um, and then future um, studies, I'm going to be looking at uh, invertebrate populations comparing Seneca and Cayuga to see any impacts that have changed over um, in the in the sediment as well as in the benthic area uh, to see if there's any impacts that gobies have made on this. So finally, thanks to all my student researchers, uh, my team, also uh, Megan Brown, my uh, plankton colleague, and uh, Brent Boscarian, who now works at Lower Prism or Hudson Prism. And I'll take any questions if there's time. Thank you.